Anything you ask, I will do. Follow me. Join me. Come, follow me. Follow me. And you'll see more. Who are you? Follow me. We talked a little bit about how when you grow up in or around the church, at some point you develop some form of what we think of as a philosophy of Christianity. Somebody hands you the basic building blocks of faith and you start to put them in place for better, sometimes for worse. Well, when I was a kid, I had a philosophy of Christianity that I suspect was probably very similar to what many of you believed and, and may still even believe to this day. And that is that basically Christianity is all about the rules, right? God created the earth, God created humans, and then God created the rules. And when he got bored with the old rules, he sent his only begotten son so that whosoever follows the rules, both the old rules and the new rules, shall not perish but have everlasting life. Does that sound about right? And all of that sounds pretty simple until... You start to actually dig into the Bible a little bit, and you find out just how many rules there actually are. I mean, you've got the Ten Commandments. You've got the Golden Rule. You've got Leviticus, which is almost nothing but a whole book full of rules. And you start to realize that following the rules is actually going to be fairly difficult. So here's what I kind of learned as a kid. A, you have to follow the rules to go to heaven. B, following the rules is hard. C, not following the rules is a lot easier and a lot more fun. Can I get an amen? And D, the people who are best at following the rules are usually the people who will judge you the most. Now, you're not going to find that exactly in the Bible, but basically that was kind of the book of Justin, okay? Circa about 1984, something like that. But here's the crazy thing. If you were to pick up the Bible and actually read Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, just the four accounts of Jesus' life that we call the Gospels, here's what you would find. Christianity is not about rule following. Christianity is about a relationship. I mean, it is relational on steroids, in fact, Jesus said, one of the reasons I've come is so that you can understand or know God the Father. In other words, to have a relationship with Him. And then He used these incredible illustrations to help us understand what our relationship with God is supposed to look like. One illustration was the relationship between a father and his child. God is a good father and we are his child. There's a relationship illustration, not rules. Another relationship illustration Jesus used was that of a shepherd and his sheep. Jesus is the good shepherd, and we are his sheep. He loves us. He cares for us. He provides for us. He protects us. That is a relationship illustration, not rules. Do you agree with me? And the word that Jesus came back to over and over and over again to describe what he wanted from us and to describe how to take steps in his direction and to describe the relationship that he wants with us is the word follow. Follow. Not do. Not accomplish. But follow. Specifically, follow and this is amazing. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus extended an invitation to follow to every single kind of person imaginable. To rich people, poor people, people who were spiritual, people that weren't spiritual, 
religious people, irreligious people, to all kinds of people. He would say, hey, I just want you to follow me. Today we began a new seven-week series called Following, where we're going to be learning about the difference between rule following and following Jesus. And, and it's all the basis of this thing that we call Christianity. This morning, I want to take you to one of the first accounts of this in the Gospels. And let me encourage you to take out your message notes and use those to kind of follow along with us this morning. We're going to be in the book of Matthew, uh, chapter 9. In the book of Matthew, we're going to look at a story about Matthew. That's kind of weird, isn't it? The book of Matthew, written by Matthew, this is a story about Matthew. Matthew chapter 9, and we begin in verse 9. And this is probably going to be uh, fairly familiar to you. Certainly, if you guys have been watching the Chosen uh, television series that we've been studying on Wednesday nights for the past year, this story will be familiar to you. Here's what it says, Matthew 9, verse 9. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Why? Why was Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth? Because Matthew was a, he was a tax collector. Now, I don't want to spend a ton of time on this because I've taught a lot about this before, but tax collectors were despised in first century Israel. And look, you may have some negative feelings associated with your local IRS agent, but that is nothing compared to how the Israelites felt about tax collectors. In fact, the only category of person I can think of that, that we would compare to a tax collector in terms of the emotion it would elicit is that 22-year-old kid, I'm going to try not to point at anybody here, that 22-year-old kid who hangs out behind the gas station and sells drugs to middle schoolers when they come through to buy candy. You know what you would feel if you saw that? What you would think about that? That's how people felt about tax collectors. To which our response would be, you know, in that situation, that is disgusting. How, how could a person ever want to be that? How could they show their face in public and know that everyone felt that way about them? And the reason tax collectors were so reviled and they were so hated during this time in Israel's history is because they were actually, this is important, they were actually Jewish people collecting Roman taxes. I mean, you think you don't like paying taxes to your own government. Imagine if by the end of 2023 a few things had changed and we were now paying taxes to the People's Republic of China. And then imagine let's say, that the mayor of Edmond got to bid on the right to become the tax collector for the People's Republic of China and that he could basically tax you as much as he wanted to and then he got to split your taxes between himself and China. That is basically how taxes worked under Roman rule. And so tax collectors were despised. They were hated. They were considered traitors to their country and understand, Matthew was one of those people. So, when Jesus walks up to Matthew in Matthew chapter 9 that we just read, there are a lot of things Jesus could have said to this tax collector. Like, hey, Matthew, how do you sleep at night, buddy? Hey, Matthew, how can you even look at yourself in the mirror, man? Hey, Matthew, I bet your mother is real proud of you. Which, if you watch The Chosen, you know she wasn't, right? We all know that, even though the Bible doesn't actually say that. I'm telling you, Jesus could have said a lot of things. And nobody would have batted an eye because everyone hated the tax collectors. But listen to what Jesus actually said to Matthew. This is still verse 9. He told him, follow me. Follow me. Now, first I want you to try to imagine how the people would have felt about this. Did I, wait a minute, did I hear him right? Did Jesus just say, follow me to this traitor of Israel? But then secondly, recognize that there were a lot of things Jesus could have asked Matthew to do that Matthew would have said, no, I, I can't do that. That's too hard. That's too much. That's too far outside of my comfort zone. But instead, Jesus looks at Matthew, he says, follow me. And then here's the best part of verse 9. I love this. And Matthew got up, and what did he do? He followed him. Here's how this looked in season one, episode seven 
of the chosen. You see the Parthian foot races last night? Darius ran like a gazelle. He's done quite a foot race. Your old friend Simon himself used to run the wagering tables. We're not friends. Next. Okay, fine. So you did not go to the races. You stay home? I went to see my mother. Ugh. That would put me out, too. She asked when you're going to give her grandchildren? She didn't ask. I thought your parents don't speak to you. I had questions I couldn't ask anyone else. A mother of a son with talent like yours should be proud. She's ashamed that I could use the talent that God gave me against God. Next. You're good at something. You found a way to make a living doing it. It's that simple. Must be nice to live in a world so simply ordered. We live in the same world, Matthew. Next. Besides, what else are you going to do with a mind like yours? Matthew. Matthew, son of Alpheus. Yes. Follow me. Me? <laughs> yes, you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> what are you doing? You want me to join you? Keep moving, street preacher. Do you have any idea what this guy's done? Do you even know him? Yes. Listen, I said to... What are you doing? Where do you think you're going, guys? Let me go. Have you lost your mind? You have money. Quintus protects you. No Jew lives as good as you. You're gonna throw it all away. Yes. I don't get it. You didn't get it when I chose you either. But this is different. I'm not a tax collector. Get used to different. I'm glad we passed by your booth today, Matthew. Yes. Shall we? We have a celebration to prepare for. You will regret this, Matthew. What's the tablet for? I grabbed it without thinking. You can put it back. No, no, keep it. You may yet find use for it. Where are we going? A dinner party. I'm not welcome at dinner parties. Well, that's not going to be a problem tonight. You're the host. Matthew's one of my favorite characters. Now, here's the deal, and it's so important that you get this. Whether you had been a religious person or an irreligious person, in that moment, you would have absolutely thought to yourself, wait, 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 it cannot be that simple. Because religion says, religion, religion has always said, if you want to be a part of this, you're going to have to start doing these things. And you're going to have to stop doing those things. And once you've started doing these things, and you've stopped doing those things to religion's satisfaction, then and only then can you be a part of what we're all about. But what Jesus says to Matthew instead is, Follow me. Walk with me. Listen to me. See what I do. Get to know me. Start to understand me. In other words, begin a relationship with me. Do you see it? Now here's what is significant about this, and, and we're going to talk about this for several weeks. This is the same invitation Jesus extended throughout the Gospels to all kinds of people. Follow me. 
And it's the same invitation that is offered to every single one of us today. Which is why there's a question I want you to begin to ask yourself this new year. Whether you're a Christian or not a Christian. Whether you're a church person or not a church person. And here's the question. Am I following Jesus? Am I following Jesus? Not do I go to church. Not do I read the Bible. Not do I do good things. But do I follow Jesus? Now if that sounds too simple to you. If that seems like the opposite of what you were taught about religion or by religious people all of your life, understand that it seemed too simple for the religious people in Jesus' day as well. Listen to what happens next. This is verse 10. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. Now, let me tell you why this is such a big, big, big deal. If you're new to Christianity and, and you're just exploring it, or maybe you've been out of church for a while. Maybe you had a bad experience at some point in your life and, and you haven't been back since. What I'm about to say, this is for you, okay? This is so important. Jesus was extraordinarily comfortable with people who weren't anything like him. And apparently, as you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, apparently people who were nothing like Jesus were very comfortable with him. Now, just let that sink in for a second. And let me tell you why that applies and how that applies specifically to our church. That means that if you're not a religious person, or if you've got serious doubts about the whole Christianity thing, or if you're not even sure exactly what you really even believe, or if you feel like you don't look like everybody else here, or if you suspect that the choices you're making and the lifestyle you're living don't match up with what you see here, because I mean, clearly, we're all perfect, at least according to Facebook, right? But if you are with us, listen to me now, and you feel anything but accepted and loved by us, I want you to know something. That is our fault. That is not our Savior's fault. Do you hear me? If you feel anything less than accepted, that's on us. That's not on Him. Why? Because our Savior was extraordinarily, amazingly comfortable with people who were absolutely nothing like Him. And that includes every single one of us in this room. And here's what I want you to understand. No matter who you are or where you've been or what you've done, Jesus would like you. You say, oh no, you don't know me. Listen to me. Jesus would like you. Jesus would love you. Jesus would not be put off by your sin. Jesus would not be uncomfortable hanging out with you. And what you need to know about OBC is that we are all recipients of God's amazing grace. Amen? In fact, OBC, I want you to do something for me. I want you to raise your hand right now. Because I know, I, I, I've told you before, one of the gifts God has given me is to see the thought bubbles above your head. And some of you are thinking right now, whoa, 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 I, he's gone off into la-la land here, and he's telling people that Jesus is okay with sin. That's not what I said. Here's what we need to be reminded of, and I want you to help me out. Raise your hand right now if you know that you're a sinner. Go ahead. Just keep them up. Raise them a little higher if you have received from God exactly what you did not deserve. Raise it as high as you can if you're thankful that you did not receive what you did deserve. Okay? Now look around. Look around. And fortunately, you put your hands down, it's getting uncomfortable. For every one of us, for every one of us that calls OBC our home, Jesus was extraordinarily comfortable with people who weren't anything like him. And we, who are nothing like Jesus, We have become very comfortable with him. That's what happened. But again, this made no sense to the religious leaders of Jesus' day. Listen to verse 11. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? In other words, 
what, are, is Jesus okay with sin, right? Why is he doing this? Why is he eating with these people? Why does he hang out with people who are nothing like him? And more importantly, nothing like us, right? Isn't that what they were really saying? It doesn't make sense. He's a rabbi. He's supposed to teach people how to avoid sin, not hang out with them in their sin. Because everybody knows that religion is about following the rules, not establishing a relationship. Verse 12. On hearing this, Jesus said, Oh man, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Now, first of all, this should have been very insulting to Matthew and all of his friends, right? They should be looking at him going, hey, wait a second. Who are you calling sick, buddy? But, you know, instead I can almost envision them looking at one another and going, who are we kidding? Right? I mean, we, we know who we are. We are kind of sick. Now, again, that is the exact opposite of what religion teaches us. Religion says, get yourself cleaned up, and then maybe you'll be good enough for God to show you some grace. Instead, what we learn from Matthew and his friends is that only people who recognize their need for God become prime candidates for God's grace. Isn't that beautiful? Now, I don't know if Jesus was trying to offend Matthew's friends, but I know this, he was an equal opportunity offender. That's one thing I really like about him. Listen to what he says next in verse 13. He says, but go and learn what this means. And you may have heard me talk about this before because it's one of my favorite places where Jesus speaks to the religious leaders. Go and learn what this means. And then he quotes an Old Testament scripture. Now, let me just, let me just pause there. I don't, even, I, I don't know if I can even adequately communicate just how offensive this would have been to the Pharisees because the Pharisees' reputation was all they did was sit around all day and read Scripture and learn Scripture and try to understand Scripture. They were literally the experts in the law. And so Jesus telling them to go and learn what a passage of Scripture means would be kind of like the first-year law student going up to the chief justice of the Supreme Court and saying, hey, chief, let me teach you a little something about the law that you probably didn't know. In this moment, Jesus says, let me take you back to kindergarten, Pharisees, all right? Let's go back to the basics. Let's go back to building blocks. And let me teach you something from the Old Testament that apparently you missed. Verse 13, but go and learn what this means. I desire, say it, mercy, not sacrifice. Oh, that is an important, important verse. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. In other words, Jesus says, I'm not content to simply hang out with people who believe all the right things and look as though they behave in all the right ways. I came to call on those who are honest about their sin and honest about their need for grace. So when I refer to you as righteous, it's in air quotes, baby. Okay, you see what I'm saying? Pharisees, here's one of the things I love about kids. We had baptism this morning. By the way, I think we should start every worship service with baptism. Yes? All agree with that? Here's what I love about kids. Kids are so, typically, they're so honest about their sin. They're honest about their need for grace. That's one of the reasons it's so important for us to minister to them and to reach out to them when they're young because they're still at a point where they are able to acknowledge and recognize their sin and understand that they need help, that they need grace in their life. It's just so important for us to be in that place in order to receive what God is trying to give to us. Now, let me just say something to those of us who would call ourselves Christians. I think this is important as well. Here's why this means so much. We dare not become a church that is content to gather together and believe the right things and even behave the right ways and stop there. Okay, let me read that again. We dare not become a church that is content to gather together and believe the right things and behave the right ways and stop there. Because if we do, I believe, we will find ourselves standing outside the mission and the blessing of God. 
listen, I don't want to pastor a church. And I don't want to attend a church. And I really don't want my family attending a church that's all about believe the right way and behave the right way and forget that we've been called to reach out to those who don't yet know Christ. Because I'm telling you right now, it is not enough to believe right. And it is not enough to behave right. Because the church, the community group, the deacon group, the ministry staff that, that is content to simply believe right and so-called behave right eventually becomes Pharisees. They eventually become judgmental. They become the ones that say, change and then you can join us. But Jesus came along and he turned it completely upside down. He messed everybody up. He shows up and Jesus says, join us and you will change. Matthew, I'm not asking you to do anything yet except stand up and follow me. And if you'll do that, then guess what? We're going to your house and we're going to cook some food and we're going to invite your friends and we're going to get to know one another. I'm not asking you to believe yet. I'm not even asking you to behave yet. I'm simply inviting you to put one foot in front of the other. Take one small step in my direction and follow me. Okay, But let me warn you, if you follow me for very long, one of these days you may look in the mirror and you may not recognize who you see. Not because you've been in some endless game of Jesus says, but because you spent time with me. Actually getting to know me. You've come to understand just how much I love you. You surrendered your life and eternity to me. And now your life is being transformed by my amazing grace. And how does that happen? Listen to me. It's not about do. It's not about accomplish. It's not even initially about change. It's about responding to a simple invitation. Follow me. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for the story of Matthew. And thank you, God, that in Matthew, we can see a reflection of ourselves and our own shortcomings. We see our own sin. We see our own misperceptions, God. Even though we may look at Matthew and think, oh, no, no, I'm not like him at all. He was terrible. People hated him. People liked me. People loved me. I'm not that bad. God, that's the wrong picture to take away from this. Help us to see none of us are good enough for your grace. None of us deserve your mercy. And what you want from us, at least initially, and as we continue in our relationship with you, is simply to follow you, to spend time with you in your presence, getting to know you, getting to know your heart. Father, coming to an understanding of what you love and what's important to you. And the more time we spend with you, the closer we grow to you. And the closer we grow to you, we begin to see change taking place in our life. But God, it's not, it's not just automatic and it's not permanent. Father, throughout our life as Christians, we're going to have to continue to make sure that we're following you and not following religion, not following rules. God, we must be following you. So I pray for someone here this morning who maybe is at the very beginning of this journey. Maybe they've been away from church for a long time or had a bad experience. Maybe they're just here, just tipping one one toe in the water. God, will you please impress upon their hearts this message that Jesus gave. Follow me. Just spend some time with me and get to know me. And then, Father, for those of us who are Christians, who are believers, who have been believers maybe for most of our lives, will you help us ask this question for this new year? Am I following Jesus? And if I'm not, what does that need to look like in my life? God, will you help us? as we work through that and process that this morning. We love you and we trust you 
to provide everything we need, no matter who we are or where we've been or where we are in relation to you, God. We trust you to provide for us. Thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. In just a moment, you're going to stand. This is a time in our service for obedience. It's a time for response. And listen, that response can take place right where you are. You don't have to move a muscle to be obedient to God. In fact, I challenge you to be as obedient to Him as you possibly can be. Don't waste this time. Don't walk out of here the same way you walked in today. Ask the question, am I following Jesus? And in the areas where I'm not doing that, how does that need to change in my life? And if you're here and you've never followed Jesus, you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior, oh, I pray this is the beginning for you. I pray that today is one tiny, giant step in His direction, okay? Not asking you to do anything, not asking you to be anything, not even asking you yet to change anything. Just simply asking you, It's going to sound different in your ears, whoever you are, as you pray. So I'm trusting you to pray and to, to speak to and to hear from your Heavenly Father. Paul and I are going to be here at the front. If somebody needs prayer this morning, you are welcome to come. If there's a decision that you're ready to share, sometimes that happens. You're welcome to come. But this is about obedience for us. We, we've got a few minutes left. Let's don't walk out the same way we walked in. Let's stand together. Let's do business with God.